So hello, everybody, and um, welcome to uh, the next episode in Everything is Energy, where I interview people who work in the energetic field um, from slightly different disciplines to the one that, that I normally present with, which obviously is tarot. And today I'm really happy to introduce Simon Lee. So full disclosure, first off, Simon and I are related. Uh, we are we are cousins, and we but we have come to our respective paths completely separately. Um, although maybe we have some maybe we have some uh, ancestral links as to what drew us to energetic practice. Um, but Simon, welcome. So just tell us a little bit about what you do and you know your what 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 a little bit about your story and what brought you into the world of energy and coaching and and, and you know what is your what is your background sure thank you for having me. um i think the main thing is to say is that i never chose the path um it was just a naturally organic process so as you're aware, when I was a child, I had a very difficult time. I had um, an abusive stepfather for 11 years, and it left me um, feeling very broken. Very, I felt very traumatized by the event. And so I went on a solo search to try and overcome these feelings and the experience I had. Because what I found was the experience actually, it paralyzed me into being able to live a full life. So I couldn't go forward. So I chose very um, small labouring jobs that I thought that was, that was the only self-worth I had. I chose um, a very insular life so that I can control everything. But eventually I, I got sick of that and it just, it, it just stopped working and it still just created great suffering. So I thought, I can't stay as I am. I can't stay as I am. And... Um, so the first thing I did is I went into physical pursuit. So I, I won the Suffering the Bodybuilder title at the tender age of 19, stood on stage with a winner's trophy and thought, I feel more terrified than ever. I thought muscles were supposed to make you feel a man. I thought they were supposed to give you some, some peace. And it didn't work. So I decided to quit that and do something else. And I went into, um, well, I fell ill for about three years because... Um, the past trauma caught up with me and I ended up having a catastrophic breakdown. Um, and I was ill for three years, but it was, it was a lifesaver. Really. I do really mean it was a lifesaver because it allowed me to look at that and think, well, I couldn't keep going the way I was going. And it, it just, everything came to a grow hole. And um, I went into meditation. I went into Qigong and I worked up to a four or five hour daily routine of meditation in order to find out who I was. And it was just a beautiful experience. I was very lucky. I had some really great instructors and um, they showed me what to do and what to experience and answer my questions. But it was a profound experience um, because for the first time, I realized that there was another part of me behind the thoughts and the feelings that I had. I almost because I started to observe myself from, from, from afar. I could observe myself thinking these thoughts and feeling these feelings. And that went on to me going into uh, Qigong, Tai Chi, martial arts and mindfulness and philosophy and ended up being a coach somehow. <laughs> so yeah. and now I work with, I spent 15 years working with children and working with um, adults as well. I would say now my is mainly uh, probably twenty percent women and um, eighty percent men and boys. It's just it's just gravitated that way in what I've done. Um, I think the men particularly like the philosophy behind it. They like um, they like the stoicism. They like the the masculine energy that that has very much become part of what I teach. But you know, I think I think for women as well, if they feel they're lacking assertiveness and boundaries and that masculine energy more 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 yang energy in chinese terms they tend to gravitate towards my um, my coaching as well so it all depends 
That's really interesting. And I think there is there's some interesting conversations, isn't there, um, around male energy and and what it means to be male and the energetic um inferences we put on on maleness so so t- talk us a little bit about what that means to you and and what's at the core of your teaching with regards to maleness and and that you know that that side of things yeah i think that's a really good question and i think it's something that's um confused quite a lot so obviously there's been a lot of confusion in the last several years about men showing their feelings and and there's this um there's this belief now that if, if men don't show their feelings it leads into toxic masculinity it leads into um a stifleness of um it leads to basically male depression and anxiety and male breakdown but I think what, what I found, what men really want, they want to be able to communicate their feelings, but also be risk takers, but also be protective. So it's not about one or the other. It's about being able to communicate their feelings openly, but still be able to go forward with what they want to do and not feel guilty about it. Um, and I know the male energy has got a huge protective force. It's, it's been there for hundreds of thousands of years. So it, it, it's still there. And I don't think men should feel guilty about that. If it's done in a positive way, I think it's fine. And as you know, Janice, I mean, I had a masterclass as a child of three toxic men in the family, very toxic men. And I think people would recognise that. They'd probably look at that and say, well, that's toxic masculinity. But for me, the terminology is use it because it's the absence of toxic. I don't look on the three men in my family that were abusive and controlling as toxic masculinity. I look on that as the absence of it. They were too frightened to be men. They were too frightened to be courageous. And so if you're not working towards the highest good you can, you're going to gravitate towards the opposite. Mm -hmm. But for men and women, I always say to them, what's your idea of the highest good? What can you aim at that's going to really elevate your values and your sense of belonging? And, and try and create a picture of that. Because if you don't, you're going to gravitate towards the opposite to have your aim on that. And I think that's a, that's a life goal in itself and can lead to all kinds of potential, healthy ambition, positive outlook on life, how you raise your family. If you're aiming at the highest good you can and you've got an idea of what that looks like, then you're already going to be moving forward in a positive way. So I, I think, I think it's really sad how um, male energy has come to be seen as in alignment with some kind of toxic, toxicity. That's quite a hard word to say, isn't it? Toxicity. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I, I don't, I don't think it is toxic. And I, and in fact, in my, in my deck, the life code deck. I very consciously depicted the emperor as not being male because so many tarot readers, especially female tarot readers, have a very negative response to the emperor card because they immediately see the energy as being domineering and controlling and, you know, overbearing and unemotional and and it's it's we're just overlaying it with with a whole load of preconceptions which is actually not accurate at all anything in its shadow form is always going to be difficult but you know as long as we keep it in the light and as you say working towards the highest good um both are absolutely necessary and i mean i have you know um i i brought up two boys i now have a boy and a girl there's you know we then my daughter lisa has has she she has reinvented herself as 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 a woman but also in that there needs to be she has in a way become more assertive and more um has has invented her own rules far more than she was able to do 
as a male so it's almost like you what in what, whatever way you want to dress it <laughs> you have to have that okay these are my rules these are my boundaries this is what I have decided for my life is right for me and I think that's right I think that um it's not stereotyping people is it it's about what does that person what does that person need more of or what have they got too much of and I think if a man if a man's a very masculine, uh, macho man that can um, portray his feelings, then who's anybody to knock that? Not causing anybody any harm. If a man's very feminine, but still very driven and doing great things, who's anybody to knock that? Mm. Uh, I think we need to get rid of these stereotypes and stop putting people in bo boxes and let people be what's really comfortable for them. And I think that yeah. is definitely the way forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, people... Sorry, yeah. Janice. I think with people with me, I mean, because I often, I still do physical training with some guys and they see me lead back, so to speak. But next moment, I can come home very emotional from having coached a, a, a traumatized child that's been through dreadful things. And I know some people look at me sometimes and think, well, well who is Simon? One minute he's this leader in the, in, in the, in the class doing this hard physical training. Next minute, he's, you know, he's, obviously emotional from being this child. And I don't really care. If mm. people want to put me in a box, that's up to them, but I'm not going to put myself in one. And mm. I think that's the key. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how does um how does energetic work? I mean obviously you've you've talked a lot about your your background with Eastern philosophy and with the with martial arts and meditation. How has that how does that now inform your coaching and how you work with your clients? Because all of that is most definitely energetic. So, you know, how do you use that in your practice? Well, the same way I used it for myself. So after I came out of that childhood, I and you just mentioned it with the, with the, with, the, with the tarot cards and, and, and the, the Kabbalah and the Torah say the same thing. Just walking around being kind, expecting your life to work out okay without any fierceness is not going to work. You will likely end up being a victim. Well, I did. And I didn't have any fierceness in me at all. So I went into martial arts to, to find this energy. And, and boy, did I find it. And when I took the lid off it, I had trouble controlling it. Um, I ended up pretty good at it, actually, teaching about seven different arts. But And, and people say to me, what was the drive to do that? The drive was only to find that part of me that I thought was missing. That was it. I wasn't bothered about beating people on the mat or winning competitions. I just wanted to find that that formidable energy that would help me give me belief in my words, in the dreams I had going forward so that I could protect what really mattered to me. And mm -hmm. at the time, I couldn't protect what really mattered to me. So I just had to have that stronger energy in order to go forward in life and achieve what I wanted. And now, I recognize the same thing. I get a lot of confused young men come to me and they've got that complete lack of, of um, that formidable darker energy that they need, um, not to cause problems, but just to protect what matters to them. Mm. Um, so we go into it a little bit. We, uh, we open up the door. Some people want to go flying through. Some people just want it half a jar, which is fine. Um, but it, everybody benefits from it, including, including, and sometimes dramatically, the ladies. Mm. Yeah, I love what you're saying about, um, and I, I love the 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 application of the protective energy towards what matters to you one of the things I work on a lot with my clients I mean if those of them that are watching this will will hear me banging on constantly what do you want what is it you actually want in your life what do you want to create really not not just um a new job or a new car or whatever what do you want your life to be because unless you can actually get a handle on on what it is you want to create in life, it's you're just sort of wandering around in the wilderness. <laughs> I um I coached a, a lady recently. Uh, I won't mention her by name, 
I think how she watches, but um, she said she was having all kinds of problems after a marriage breakup. And um, she was letting this man take advantage on pretty much every single level. And I, I said, why are you not standing up to this man? You know, you've got two children. And this is another thing. They're watching how you react to the situation, mm -hmm. building their own sense of self from it. And she said, well, I was raised as a good Christian. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, well, good, good will for everybody. Um, and, the, and what was clear was that she had no protection at all what mattered to her. She had mm. no protection. She had this idea that that was fundamentally wrong. You just give, 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 and you drain your resources. Mm. And what's left at the end, you can then do something with. Yeah. And it was a re-education process saying, that's wrong because you're never mm. going to do anything. You would never have anything left because if you've got no boundaries or no... Mm. No self-serving interest at all. You're never going to have anything left. In fact, you're always going to be running on empty. So I think you're right. I think a lot because you can go into schools now and there's signs on the wall saying "just be kind," and of course that's true, but it's not enough. Mm. It's not enough. There's also the stuff we're talking about now about how to protect what really matters to you. There's many other elements of this as well. Um, are you working at the highest good? Do you know what that looks like? What are you hanging on to? One of the big things for me, Janice, was when I was, um, when I'd had my breakdown and um, I went to see a, 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 a profound spiritual teacher called Peter Hudson. And Peter Hudson was an interesting man because he was the nature path for Linda McCartney, Paul McCartney's right. lady. He knew Spike Milligan, Rod Daltrey, um, a lot of the a lot of the big big names of the past. If you've got younger viewers, they probably won't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but... Um, and he said to me that I really need to change. And he said, which one of you is saying that? Mm. And he, that's when he was introduced me to George Gurdjieff's book, First the Miraculous, where he, the, the idea is that we are not one personality. There are a hundred different personalities, all bang for dominating attention throughout our life, which is why you get people do crazy things sometimes and say, I don't know what I was thinking of. I was out of my mind. I was out of character. They're not kidding. Because mm. these and, and at some point, as George Gurdjieff said, you have to you have to decide who's going to be the captain of your ship. Because yeah. that captain has got to keep all the others on a leash. Mm. So you always know what the right thing to do is because this particular personality will be in charge. And that was a real game changer for me. Because I remember as a young man. One minute I'd be aggressive, one minute I'd be a victim, one minute I was angry. And it's like I had a million different voices in my head telling me to behave in different ways. And I had no captain of the ship in order to navigate forward. So for me, that was, uh, I had to decide, and that's the way out of it, decide, well, what is that high school? What am I actually aiming at here? Mm. And we're all aiming at something. Yes. Whether it's just to uh, watch a box series on Netflix every night, which is still an aim. It might not be the best one, but it's still a name. So we get to decide what we aim at. But it does yeah. involve getting all of those personalities in order and mm. finding out which one you want to captain your ship. So how do you how do you use meditation or with clients? One of the the you know meditation is is becoming a lot more mainstream these days. And certainly when I encourage clients to to begin meditating, you probably find the same thing. There's there's often a good deal of, well, I know I should, but I, it's just really hard. And I tried it once and I kind of failed and, oh, I'm no good at it. So what's your approach with clients with regards to meditation? And what what do you what results do you see from from that? Yeah, that's a really good question again, because um, you're absolutely right, especially, Janice, men. So you get them to sit on a floor cross-legged and do meditation. Um, I have to say, most of the women are, are pretty good. They give it a go. The men are just... Uh, the thing is, straight away, their ego is saying, no, don't do it. It's, this is strange. This is weird. Don't go along with it. So I have to change it. So when I was doing martial arts, 
one of the um, one of the practices we did, we'd hold up a pad. Opponent would hold up a pad, and we would do certain breathing technique and certain posture, and we'd hit the pad. And it was meditation in movement. Everything would quieten down. So what I had to do was I had to lead, especially the guys, but the women love it too. I have to say, uh, I had to lead them for more dynamic form of meditation backwards slowly into the seated stuff and the very still still tech and they were only open to that if they got to do the really dynamic um also, almost anger anger inducing first in order to excite their nervous system calm down their thinking and lead it gradually back to still stuff and then for men i mm. found that very very well um and what do they get out of it? I think the dynamic stuff, they certainly get to channel their emotions. They certainly get them, to, they can they can raise their emotions into an exercise without having to speak about it. Mm. They know they're angry when they're hitting that pad. I know they're angry, I can see it. Sometimes they get emotional. I've had men, men and women be hitting that pad. And I do call it moving meditation because it is, it's just a repeated movement over and over with breath, sound, a movement they'll burst into tears mm -hmm. i remember a business owner a chap who burst into tears once but i don't know why i'm crying and i said it's because you've you you everything's coming up on that pad you're allowed to use great force breath move that pad and it's excited your nervous system to the point where you're allowed to release emotion yeah the women's different they tend to like they tend to be good the other way around they start with the still meditation and then they'll work up. It's very odd, but it works. Oh. So it allows both men and women to release their emotions without necessarily having to go into it too much in a dialogue way. Um, physically feel their bodies when they're hitting that pad and moving and breathe. And it also allows them to be aware of their breath for the first time because no one's aware of their breathing. They hold their breath during the day. They sigh a lot. They're holding their, their, their shoulders up. Just being, just having that breath awareness is, is very freeing for a lot of people. But I've, I have to teach what I call the three breaths. So I have a dynamic breath on the pad. I have a secondary breath, which I use in big Tai Chi style movement, style, style movement, where it's a bit slower. And then I have the seated meditation where we do a variety of breath work and total stillness apart from the breath. And I find for me that that works very, very well because you always come up against. I mean, for instance, there was a lad I coached who was a serious cocaine addict, and he'd snorted so much cocaine, his skull was starting to rot away. And this guy was so agitated, so angry. I've never felt so much anger and agitation from anybody since. There's no way I could have sit down on a cushion. No, no, no. But when I got him hitting that pad, letting everything out, I said, I want everything that's in you out of you on that. All you got to do is breathe, hit, and move over and over. It was incredible. It was a profound experience for me and him. Yeah. Because for the first time ever, he could let that out in a controlled environment. And it was a form of moving meditation. And it was just extraordinary. But there's no way I could have got him to sit in position. No, no. No. Eventually, he did, though, once he exhausted himself, he came down and was able to sit still. So there's there's so many different things going on with him. Yeah. And and are you still working with him? No, he's um he's uh, got a girlfriend now. He's working full time. He's okay he's off the cocaine. Um, eleven years he was on. Eleven years. Oh. So yeah, he's done very very well. Wow, that's, that's, that's yeah, yeah, that's amazing, and it's 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 so fantastic when you can actually see the good that this work does in in people's lives. I mean, I'm 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 I've just become in love with the idea of energetic work. I think for me, it it just forms the basis for everything and I've become one of the reasons I'm doing this interview series is because I've, I'm fascinated with how people you know how many different ways there are of um of providing a road in to mm. changing 
your life energetically because it is energetically i mean it, psychology is is also energy but but you you know we're talking about our complete selves our energetic selves and how we what we project out into the world and what comes back at as as a result of what we're projecting into the world and how much control we have with that exchange and the difference it makes to our lives in reality because it changes lives fundamentally absolutely and i think it's right what you said about energy there because um just the way we move, just the way we speak, just the way, I mean, psychology, neuroscience has proved that all our cells vibrate at a certain frequency. And if we mm -hmm. dwell on something enough that's negative, it will change that frequency. How we move, we actually move through our past experiences. Phenomenal. Every part of us is um, this energetic connection. That if we, if we go down the wrong road or... The big thing, Janice, is with the men is with, with vice. I mean, um, whether they're watching porn all the time or drinking too much or taking drugs or whatever it may be, everything declines. It's not they think they have this idea that they can keep it a secret behind closed curtains, no one will know, and they go into the office and no one will know. But what they forget is it changes the entire energetic connection of your physiology completely. Yeah. You do take it with you, and it is obvious. It's in very subtle movements, very subtle expressions of your face, of your voice, of your words, but it's always there because you cannot be, be indulged in a vice and not change the energetic connection of your whole body. It's impossible. You do take it with you. It comes out in maybe very subtle expressions, very subtle habits, but it's there. And that's a big thing with the people I teach to say, look, um, I was with a, a seminar um, last year with, with the great Jeff Thompson, BAFTA award winning Jeff, Jeff Thompson, who writes a lot about spirituality now. And he was saying, when we sat around the table, he said, write on that piece of paper, you don't have to show anyone, that what's, what's the worst thing you'd, you'd, you'd hate people to know about you. See if you can write it down. That you keep behind closed curtains, you keep behind closed doors. Mm. And that's a big thing. And because he agreed, because whatever you write down there, you take that with you everywhere. And you do. Yeah. So um, I've, I've um, treated many, many addicts. Um, and one of the things that pain is, that it's also fear, is, is the pain of taking on a, a responsibility of where you are now. That, that was a big thing. That just came out in coaching. I always thought it was addictions there to soothe the pain. Um, I get that because I did it myself. My first... My first addiction was, um, well, my only addiction, shall I say, was, was exercise. And I always say the first, the first addiction you come across as a child will probably be the one you go to later on in life, pretty much standard. If it's alcohol, if it's drugs, you'll go back to it later because you remember, oh, I remember how that soothed the pain. So for me, it was exercise. And I literally did it until I passed out. I literally hit the floor, passed out, and I was ill for three years. So even though I knew my body was breaking down and it wasn't doing me any good, I couldn't stop, which is what an addiction is. You know, it's um, doing you harm, but you cannot stop doing it. The negative consequences. Um, so I really, I really get that soothing the pain, but it also stopped me from taking responsibility because Janice, the truth is, I knew I was hiding. I knew I was hiding from life. I knew that if I let my thoughts and feelings go from my past, from my stepfather, I'd be on full glare. And I'd have to, I'd have to progress, I'd have to expand. That was bloody terrifying. And that was enough to keep me in the addiction. The fear of taking responsibility. The fear of owning my own home, of actually having to fall in love. The fear of taking responsibility, of being vulnerable, that was overwhelming. That was the big fear. That was the biggest fear. So it started as a soothing the pain. But actually, the big fear was responsibility. If, if, I, if I let it go, then I've got to face this. I, yeah. I, don't, want to, I don't want to do that. And I'm not willing to do it. Yeah. So I would rather... I was at a point, and I see this with lots of guys, and, and your your listeners may find this extraordinary. 
but men would rather a lot of men would rather kill themselves than face their own fears mm. that's a big thing to say it's true of me that's why i say yeah. falling ill saved me but i would rather have killed myself than faced my fears and and a heightened responsibility yeah. no doubt and, and i'm i see it every week men would rather my let their life go than face their fears and what is what is what what is at the root of that? What what causes that? I mean, I you know, I I do you think you know? Obviously, your story is 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 one aspect. Do you think there is a common thread that runs through all of that, or do you do, do you, what, or is it intrinsically a male thing? What is, what do you think is at the root of that? It's definitely more male than female. The suicide rates in the UK demonstrate we're up to, I mean, they haven't released the, uh, the last figure since the, uh, the pandemic, but we're up to, up to 73, 74% of all suicides in the UK. So the, the, the numbers are speaking for themselves, yes. I think it's great shame. Um, I think it's shame that you've, you've reached this point because I think a, me, a lot of men think, especially if they're the breadwinner, they think, well, I can't let my wife know I'm, I'm suffering like this. I don't want my children to know, so they lock down. I saw a couple of men just a couple of weeks ago that were both identical in their approach to this of locking down and saying to me, I mustn't let my wife know. And I'm thinking, what sort of relationship have you got if you can't even speak to your wife? This is, this is just crazy, and we have to go into that. But for me as well, I mean, I didn't know, even know what my shame was. My shame was not being able to protect my sister when my stepfather was picking on her. That I didn't, I didn't unpack that till years later. That was my great shame. I, I couldn't protect her. Yeah. So I thought I need to be punished. Yeah. And, and that's it. Normally has some sort of shame, guilt. Well, I just can't yeah. say anything. I'd rather I'd rather die. I'd rather take my life. And that's yeah. my job to to say to these men, you've been told you you fed yourself a lie, you've downloaded a lie into your consciousness, it's not even true. And yeah. to unpack that and show them the way out. Because I'll tell you now, Janice, there's been times where I have crisis calls and I meet men as they're about to do the deed. And they're looking in my eye for a reason not to do. So in that moment, I've got this massive responsibility. Yeah. And it's about a connection between two human souls in that moment, where these guys are looking at me for a reason not to do it, not to go home and hang themselves in the garage, not to go home and do something crazy. They're looking at me thinking, I need to look in your eyes and see a reason not to do this. Yes. But it's also a beautiful moment to no, you can't get a, a closer human connection in that moment mm. when someone's looking to end their life. Yes, I mean, it's the ultimate cry for help, isn't it? I mean, Everything you know, falls away. Everything falls away. Yeah, yeah. And and also a huge a huge turning point, hopefully, um, in, 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 in asking for help in that way. That then takes them to the pivot where they've confronted actually the you know the the ultimate darkness and once you've confronted that actually i think there it, it's almost like it, it becomes empowering you know it's it's not to say it's an easy journey back but you know once you've gone to that point and somebody has been there to stretch out a hand it it must be a t it must be a turning point in in life that moment. Yes, and back on the energy thing you were talking about earlier is that is um those guys once they realise that um all that darkness they feel is is they can they can actually come out and it only takes one light in that darkness one tiny flicker of light. Once they come out of it, they've got they've still got this. <laughs> huge dark energy that they can use as a creative force and a lot of guys I've coached have gone on to be incredible athletes started their own business met the girl of their dreams whatever else they may do because they've got 
and this is the thing i know we talk about post post traumatic stress um but there is that post traumatic growth i'm not saying for anybody that um it's been through terrible things that you know it's it's some divine will but who knows but um some people do go through horrific things but there's no arguing that if you go through adversity you can channel that energy into something positive absolutely you can i did a little one of my little videos the other day looking at positive and negative energy and how i i mean it, it sounds like a big thing to say there is no positive and negative there is just all energy but if we if we look at so called dark energy and we use it as a way of comparing and contrasting with the light, we can get ourselves a really good navigation system by using both effectively. So what we don't want to do is, as you've just said, lock down the dark energy, push it away, because what you push away pushes back, because that's what energy does. Whatever you apply force to will apply force back. Um, and so we if we can if we can dance with it more effectively, if we can if we can have a relationship with darker energy that is more proactive and as I said, is more of a sat nav, um, I think we start to become much, much more effective human beings to bring everything into alignment and to understand that everything, must exist dark energy must exist it, it, it we term it dark energy it, it it is just energy in reality it is just things we do and it is it is our view of it um and i think we 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 become very polarized don't we in the way we in the way we see and judge things but as you say who's to say that this dark energy that this guy or this woman has gone through isn't actually all to the light it's it it everything has it's everything is important everything is a signpost everything everything that you are and that you experience lends to your bigger picture I'm probably gabbling a bit here but i i feel very passionate about it that that we we really mustn't be too prescriptive about um, pushing dark energy down. No, like absolutely. That. Absolutely. It reminds me of the, um, I'll show it here actually, because it's such a beautiful quote by the spiritual teacher Almas. Um, and it was written that everything we go through in life, every, every anxiety, every depression, um, every I can't remember the exact terminology. It's a beautiful quote. I'm not doing any justice here, but it's it said about every 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 um everything that's trying to get your attention. It's prodding you with anxiety and depression, with these um different different things that make us uncomfortable. It, it does that because there's a part of us inside that loves us loves us so much. It wants to get our attention to look there again to kind of self correct. And it's not it's not there to give you a hard time, not there to disrupt your life. It's there out of love. So that anxiety it brings, that depression, is its way of prodding you and saying, Look, we love you so much. I want you to look here and address it. I love that. I think it's an amazing way of looking at it. Yes, absolutely. And certainly, you know, when we if we bring the idea of spirituality into the picture our relationship with the energetic stroke spiritual world, if we can see it as that, if we can see those prods, if we can see those closed doors, what appear to be struggles with us as communication rather than life just being, you know, um, torturous and horrible. If we can see those things as communications, to show us the way to a happier more empowered life then i think we do it more justice mm, absolutely absolutely yeah it's hard to do at the time it is. when you're in when you're in, the, when you're in the, uh, the the cauldron of turmoil but um 
you know it, if you can use it as a as a compass mm. and find a way out and 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 turn into it turn into that pain turn into the message and see what see, see what's there and then it becomes it becomes an escape in its own right um yeah because as you said if you don't and you try and push it down i think john trudel he said what you hide from looks for you anyway mm -hmm. well i found that to be true very true well it is true it's true for us all and you know when i when i'm i coach people in terms of um energy and relationships a lot and it's almost slam dunk true every time that negative relationships show up as a reflection of some kind of hidden trauma or some kind of hidden stuff that is again being pushed down and those relationships are showing up as a mirror for that and they are echoing trauma within in some capacity and that it's it just it's just the way it works it's just the way it works what you push down will show up for you in your life yeah <laughs> because exactly. yeah it, it won't let you hide it you know, it, it's just not going to happen often it may as well take moment. <laughs> yeah <laughs> often at the worst possible moment <laughs> yeah yeah, it's a bitch, but we all have to look in the mirror and own it sooner or later because if we don't, it's just going to keep on going. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's having yeah. the courage to turn into that mirror and have a look. Mm -hmm. uh, I say this to a lot, of, a lot of the men I coach, you know, you can have the courage to look in the mirror and see you become a bully, the mm -hmm. vice that you're addicted to, how you treat your children, how you treat yourself. Yeah, that that can be a, that 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 mirror image can be the one out. There is no other way out. You have to be you have to be honest and you have to own it fully. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a powerful thing to do. It's a power. If you can't do that, if somebody can't look at themselves and want to uncover what they've created, and this is the key, what they've created. So many people say to me, "Well, it wasn't my fault," and I used to say that. Absolutely, I used to say that. I used to say, "Well, you know, I was just a child." And I remember going back to that man, Peter Hudson, my first mentor. I remember um, he opened the doorway to my anger because I was with him one evening and he was saying, um, why don't you do this and why don't you do that your life and things? And I said, well, you don't understand, Peter. I said, my childhood, you know, it, was, it was, wasn't good. And, and he looked at me and he said, at some point you've got to quit whining. I know, he was that blunt. Um, you've got to quit whining about your past and just get on with it. He said, you've got this creative force because of that. You're not using it. You're just hiding. And I remember driving home absolutely furious. I pull over on the side of the road, but I knew he was right. That was the real anger. I knew he was right. I was hiding. Mm. And I had to face that, and I wasn't ready to face it. But I was yeah. so angry because he told me the truth. Yeah. It held up the mirror and said, look, you're hiding. Are you an excuse now? Mm. Yes. I mean, you've got to, as a, as a coach, you have to you have to use those moments judiciously because if you do that too soon in the process, you can drive somebody away. But he obviously got you at the right moment where you were able to, while you were angry, you were able to um, at least, you know, process it effectively and you presumably you didn't run away you you went back and went oh, and mm. no more whining for me then yeah absolutely so i tried for a while longer <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah absolutely no you're right you have to choose the right the right moment i mean um i, I have some men in front of me that they really need a, a harsh word but mm. other guys i know that that wouldn't work and that they're, they're extremely often broken and, and need a much gentler approach but you you, you intuitively get a, a hand for that over time knowing what the right approach is and what's needed um but that that you've got to be very careful with that but the main thing is is that you're there to serve you're there to help you're there to um point the way not yeah. dictate the way but point the way and whether they yeah. decide to go there or not is up to them yeah absolutely so simon 
before we wrap up what's what's next for you what are your what you've got some new stuff coming up i think haven't you you've got new plans so what what's what's ahead on the path that you have planned yes well um i'm back on gb news in a couple of weeks which will be exciting with one of my uh, 16 year old student actually which would be nice um and i've got a, a book in the making um some audio products in the making too and as i say i have to protect them with my time otherwise it just won't happen so uh yes and just basically uh, expanding things online and uh looking forward to the future and uh, yes it's um it's a real honor to do what i do though mm. uh, i think one of the questions people ask me is um that you find it hard taking all that stuff home with you never it's such an honor to be able to help people in this way mm. I, I never take it home some of the children's stuff used to get a bit um tough sometimes i'd had to pull over on the way home sometimes and think wow did that really happen to that child that's terrible but all in all it's an honor and uh i need to reach a bigger audience now so we're going to start off a, a warrior youth program for uh teenage boys Oh, great. Um, yes, yeah, so that, 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 that's exciting. But yes, yeah, so there's lots of um, building the team, expanding the team so that we can uh, reach more people. So, yeah, it's uh, perfect. That's going. good. So, how can people reach you, Simon, if they want to reach you? Well, I'm going to put the information uh, in as a link as well. But but how how is best for people to, to find you if they want to? Uh, they can go to the website, which is um, simonlee.online, um, or they can email us at uh, info at simonlee.online. Okay. Uh, inquiries, and we'd be happy to um, answer anything we discuss. Great. That's really great. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much. You. That was a fascinating Good. conversation. Good. Glad you liked it. It was a pleasure to be on as well. Thank you for asking. Yeah, no, that's my pleasure. That's my pleasure. I think it's going to be a, a fascinating series, and um, you know, I get to, I get to talk to people who, as I said, they are, are applying energetic practice in lots of different ways, and I just think it's fascinating to see how many ways there are, because you know, tarot isn't right for everybody, you know. Eastern philosophy isn't right for everybody, but there are so many different routes in mm. to get the job done. And I think that's what I find so fascinating. I think it's a lack of understanding as well, isn't it? When people see tarot reading, they have got their own ideas of what that means. It's normally never correct. Mm. So understand, people don't understand what the approach is and what it means because they've been They've had one experience or they just think they know when actually when they when they look at it, it's completely different. Yeah. Yes, it is. And I think it's been changing and evolving hugely, um, you know, over the over the last probably over the last 10 years. It's it's taken a huge um, step up um, now. And, and the and the idea of tarot just being a fortune telling thing you know the divination thing I mean obviously there are still many people that use it and, and it has being able to look 360 front and back has got a huge amount of um you know you can use that in the most amazing ways but just fortune telling really is not using tarot to anything like its its capacity so um yeah so I'm on a mission to place it on the on the stage with um you know with all of the other philosophical and healing practices excellent so sure you will good so anyway simon it was lovely to meet you and um you know good luck for everything you're doing in the future and yeah and i will catch up soon i'm sure absolutely it's been great thank you very much janice Thanks speak to you soon okay bye-bye